G'day community and welcome to episode 7 of the JRBBL podcast. My name is Damo and joining me as he does every single week is Azza. How are you going, Azza? Absolutely fantastic, mate. The lockdown is approaching. I'm trying not to panic, but hopefully we can get some good uh, content out here today to put everyone a little bit more at ease as we approach 7.15 tonight. I'm panicking myself. I don't think my team is prepared at all. And we've also got Ben from Honeyball. Honeyball have just launched their magazine, which you can buy at their website for five ninety five. Ben, how are you? Very well, thanks, uh, Damo. Um, obviously, yeah, busy day with Supercoach starting up. So yeah, hopefully we can glean some insights for the for the listeners and um, yeah, have a bit of fun along the way. Ben, tell us about the magazine. How did that come together? Uh, the magazine itself. Um, I suppose I'm keenly interested in fantasy sports and, and play AFL Supercoach and BBL Supercoach and Premier League and whatnot. So I've always had a bit of interest in being a competitive person. I'm, I'm always looking for an advantage. And um, I suppose the magazine spawned out of the idea that I found there was heaps of awesome content out there, but the stuff I found the best was, was speaking to or listening to experts like former winners and top 10 finishers. Um, so I thought a magazine which... Uh, highlights them and puts them in a good platform would be a, a really good idea. Um, so I don't preach to be an expert myself. I think it came about 300th in Supercoach last year and generally struggle in AFL Supercoach. So I, I try to give the experts um, the platform to tell, uh, to talk about strategy and decision making. Very good. And is your team anywhere near complete, even though we're only about five hours from the first bat flip? Uh, I tend to wait, not to the last minute, but uh, within a few hours of the first game to start just to finalise my team because I like to get as much info as possible. Like we've already seen a few players pull out uh, of round one in the last 24 hours. So I've got six or seven locks and then the team's kind of building around that, but I haven't. it's not set in stone by any means. It's good that you mentioned players being unavailable because we've had a few internationals decide that they don't want to play anymore because they've been in COVID restricted, COVID restricted conditions pretty much all year and have decided that they want to spend some time at home with their families, which is understandable, especially in this tough year. But it's meant that we've had to sort of shuffle our teams a bit and, and uh, reshuffle our trade plans as well. Um, as a, do you want to go through some of those um, changes? Yeah. So um, unfortunately we've um, lost, Tom Banton and Tom Curran from BBL uh, this year, and as well as uh, Johnny Bairstow, but Bairstow has uh, left because he will be unavailable due to international duty. But no, uh, Tom Banton and Tom Curran have both returned home after a long year, which is incredibly understandable. And there have been some uh, replacements. We have heard from the Sixers today that Jake Ball has been signed up. Uh, He'll come He's already on his way here. He'll be in quarantine, so probably won't start until round four. And then likely uh, Heat haven't yet to sign anyone um, to replace Banton, but the rumoured signing is Joe Denley. Uh, if he comes, he'll be another fantastic addition and one definitely to watch out. But uh, he won't be here as well until a little later on because of uh, quarantining. Hasn't arrived yet, hasn't signed, so watch that space very closely. And then we've also got the BBL players injured as well. So we'll be looking to see who replaces them in the short term until they recover. Um, It was just said uh, today, in fact, Honeyball tweeted this out not that long ago, that uh, Mornay Morkel is still recovering from an ankle injury and and then uh, Jack Wildermuth has been picked up by the the Oz A squad um, to replace, who is it? Was it Moises on Rorique's that he's... that he replaces. Um, So it looks like they're going to have to find some bowling options out of nowhere. Ben, what's your take on this? Like who's going to bowl for the heat? Yeah, it's a really good question. So yeah, the the list of absentees there is really long in the bowling department. Steckity, Majib's out as well. He's got COVID. Um, Gregory, obviously over in South Africa. Uh, Schweppes and Willens is injured and and Walkle now as well. I think Mork was going to miss the first two games. So um, the ones who I'm anticipating to get a gig 
uh, a Bartlett and Kuhneman. So Kuhneman's a spinner who's played a little bit before, not much. And Bartlett has been around the, the heat setup before. Um, I think he's early 20s, so not one of these these kids who's just getting a crack um, to, to train with the squad. So I think they're, they're probably the two who will come in. And then that, there's also that all-rounder role, which, um, which Wildermuth leaves vacant. And the two there would be either Basley, who a lot of people are keen on, or Malenko, who's probably the more experienced option, having played for the, the Canes for a while. Um, personally, I'm hoping Basley gets a go because he's cheap. Um, but uh, that's that's TBC. And I always find the Heat are one of the most unpredictable sides in terms of selection because I think Book's a bit, a bit random at times with his selections. So I, I don't know which way they're going to go. As a yourself... Yeah, the heat, hey? Um, it's going to be a very interesting 11 to see um, what they put together. Um, I I echo all those thoughts that Ben has just put up. I also probably think the likes of Dan Lawrence uh, might get an extra over or 2 in the bowling. He's done it in the past, and I think they're probably going to be looking to him um, to help supplement the losses that they have. But it's going to be hard to be picking any other than um, any of the cheapies um, that are available. I, I've put in Max Bryant now that Wildermuth's out just to shore up that batting lineup a bit and also to maybe bring in a bit more of a, a loophole option. But uh, it is a bit of a yeah, bit of a concern for the team. But I think uh, once they get all the players back fit and firing, they'll be a definitely uh, a side that'll be. Good to watch, and uh, especially with if uh, Chris Lynn can get back into some form too. Just to, just to jump in on that, sorry, Damo. Um, another player, because you're talking about those extra overs, I think Sam Hazlett has bowled a lot yeah, uh, true. at club level, club level lately, and I think he's been a little bit under the radar. Um, obviously, he might bat a bit lower in the order, but I think he might bowl a few overs as well, so he's one to keep an eye on. And speaking of injuries, Marcus Stoinis was left out of the third T20 uh, game for Australia with his side strain. There's every chance he doesn't play both of the Stars games in this double game week. Does that worry you at all, Azza? Of course it does. I mean, we've, we've talked about it earlier about uh, seeing Wildermuth and McDermott out. It's just thrown a lot of teams into chaos. If um, Stoinis is out as well, well, geez, that's just... A huge loss for the for the game and for super coaches. I will be watching that space very closely. Yes, his side strain is a concern. We've seen him pull out of a couple of games, especially the latest T20 match. Uh, hopefully, he gets up. If he does, he'll be in my side. If he doesn't, then yeah, I'll be looking to probably swap him for someone like a James Faulkner, um, who's going to be damaging with the bat and ball, and also then can have that option of uh, coming in for round two when the Hurricanes have a a double game week, or there might be some just some other random shuffling that I'll do. But fingers crossed that he plays. Otherwise, it's going to be uh, pretty challenging after the uh, after the BBL lockout. And as as I said, there Ben McDermott for the Hurricanes has also been picked up in one of the Australian squads there, so he's no longer a cheap option for your wicket keeper spot. I know he was a popular selection, and you were very keen on him as well, Azza. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had him in most of my most of my side preseason sides. I would have loved to have him uh, in that wicket keeper bench position or on the field as a bit of a a loophole prospect and to have uh, ready for round two. He was in fantastic form recently in a uh, warm-up game against Sixers where he hit uh, 96 off about 50 balls, which was just unbelievable, and also said himself that he would be batting top three. He probably still might come into my side a bit later on, um, but obviously it won't be for until at least he gets back from the Oz A side. And there's also been some local replacement players for these players who have been selected for the Oz A squad. I can't reel all of their names off, but are there any that stand out to you that could potentially play early? I know the Haw- uh, the Scorchers picked up Corey Riccicioli, who's been doing um, network with the Australian squad. Um, anyone else that could potentially play early as this replacement? A bit of a tough one um, because, yeah, there have there are, as we've said, quite a lot of replacement players um, that have been since named. I probably like the looks of um, Gurinder Sandu from the uh, Sydney Sixers who's just picked up. He's obviously a past BBL player and um, 
may be able to get a game in, especially with the likes of Sean Abbott and uh, Tom Curran missing. Uh, might be able to get uh, a game. Otherwise, yeah, as you just uh, mentioned there, um, the Scorchers have also picked up a couple of players that might be able to get a chance. Similarly, um, as Ben also mentioned, Simon Malenko was another local replacement player that just got picked up that might also get a chance for round one, two, and is one to keep an eye out for. Sorry, Ben, we seem to be just talking and not giving you a chance to say anything. Do you have any replacement players that are on your radar? Um, I do, and and I've probably got a few here written down in front of me who may not be replacement players, but cheap ones who might come into the side. So I'll, I'll kind of run through them. But um, one who's who I've had a little bit of a look at is is Ryan Gibson at Adelaide. So obviously Adelaide aren't playing round one, but um, his form in their trial games has been really good. Um, he's played BBL before. Their batting lineup looks pretty settled, but I'm not a hundred percent confident. Uh, Matt Short is locked in. So I think he might be one to just keep an eye on. He's only 62K. Um, he's an experienced player. I think he's about 25. So he's a, he's a chance. Um, from the heat, yeah, Malenko, we already talked about him. The Canes, maybe Nick Winter at 42K. He's been bowling well in the trial games. But I think they're probably settled on their four quicks as Faulkner, Ellis, Meredith and Bowen. So I think he misses out. Um, cheap options at the Renegades. Mackenzie Harvey has been pretty good in a few trial games, and he was good a couple of years ago in the Big Bash, and I don't think he played last year due to injury. So he's one who could slot into that batting lineup. Pretty cheap option, um, but they play on Saturday, which makes it a bit hard. Um, and the other one there is John Holland, who, again, not a replacement player, but only 42K. And I think with with Nabi, uh, Tahir, Noor, and Imad all unavailable, so all spinners, all unavailable for this first game, he might come in and bowl some spin with Boyce. Um, so he's really a cheap option at 42K. He's a really experienced cricketer, and I reckon he's the kind of guy who'll um, have a pretty tight economy, so one to look out for there. Um, the Scorchers, there's one who I've got on my radar. I'm not sure if I'll, I'd pick him because, again, they play on Saturday, but Aaron Hardy yeah. is a bat bowler who has been going really well in the trial games, and the Scorchers have got a bit of an issue with their – all round options with with um, Agar and Marsh out. I'm not sure who's going to make up the overs. There's been a bit of talk about Munro or Turner bowling the extra four. Both aren't really um, reliable on recent on recent form with the ball. So the alternative to that is the score just going with five out and out bowlers, which might be a bit risky. So the alternative to that is playing Hardy at seven, who can bowl a few overs and, and bat, which, given his form, is a little bit tempting. Um, sixes, yeah, like you just said, Sandu is a good one. Either Sandu or Rogers will play. They're a bowler short. So I think one of those two will play. They've both played a lot of cricket in Tasmania, so I think they um, they might back him in. Um, and even uh, is it Lawrence Neil Smith, who's another Tasmanian quick bowler, he might play. But I think I think it'll be either Sandu or Rogers who plays tonight, um, both in the 70K mark. So... Could be a cheap option, which everyone jumps on once we find out the 11s. Uh, and then finally at the Thunder, there's there's Oliver Davies, who's only 42K. He he looks a, a handy one, actually. He made some runs in a um, T20 game recently. Probably not in their best 11 at the moment, but if someone goes down, I reckon he's first in. So um, might be a chance. Um, so, yeah, in terms of replacement players, probably only a handful. But there's a couple of cheapies, I reckon, worth keeping an eye on. Yeah, and just on Aaron Hardy there, in an intra-club recently, he took four wickets and scored did something like 50-odd runs off 30-odd balls as well. Mm. So he's definitely pressing his claims to play early in that squad. And I know Adam Vogues is a huge fan of him. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was awesome. I think it was a, yeah intra-squad game and he made 40 off 20 and took four poles, which, you know, that's banging down the door. And there's that role which they clearly need someone to fill. So I think he's a genuine chance, but um, it's tough when they play the last game in the round. So um, if you've got the opportunity to wait and see, uh, you'd probably best do that. And as a – where do we go from here? Well, um, <laughs> yeah. we've we've gone through the entire run sheet in 15 minutes. It's amazing. Um I guess we start with the Q&A now. 
Well, I think before we jump into that, I've, I've just got a, a little point I want to make about the um, Aussie T20s, if you want to talk about that. Yeah, easy, man. Yeah, yeah go for it. I think so. Um, I know I know. as I took a keen interest in the, um, the scores and the T20s and the ODIs, and I found the T20s to be quite indicative in terms of uh, the new scoring system, and I thought it was worth raising in this forum some of the um, – some of the points I noted. So obviously we had three games and it's a good sample size to kind of see who's going well, who's not. Um, but the, the guys who scored the most and had the best averages were generally the batsmen. So that's a bit of a change from last year's Big Bash where the bowlers tended to to dominate and get the bigger scores. And we've obviously seen a change with the um, the point system where a wicket's worth 20, not 25. It's a bit harder to get that bowling strike rate bonus. And the batting bonuses have changed a little bit so the, some of the trends were that, you know, Matty Wade, once he opened the batting, got two huge scores. Um, Moses Henriques, when he was a genuine all-rounder and bowled four overs, got a massive score. Um, and Mitch Swepson, who was awesome across the series, he didn't get a score above 100. So it probably shows that there might be a bit of an evening up of the batting and bowling dynamic, which was a bit lopsided towards the bowlers in BBL 09. Um, so I think that's that's kind of interesting in saying that. AJ Ty and Daniel Sams, you look back at their series and you think they got tonked. They still both averaged around the 30s, which isn't terrible. And you'd imagine in the Big Bash, they'll probably both get a wicket or two more uh, against lesser opponents. So I just think there's a little bit to glean there in terms of that imbalance between batter and bowler. Azza? Yeah, no, I think that's uh, very valuable information. I think, yeah, um, I did a little bit of work uh, on those scores and yeah it was good to sort of get a bit of a picture and how our players are going to look to play and how the scoring system is going to work and it also gave me an opportunity to start looking at who my captain is going to be in round one and just purely because of his consistency I'm locking in Adam Zampa at this stage with um, the vice captain going sing to Darcy Short given he plays in that first game and I absolutely loved what Sampa did, and I think he's going to be uh, taking a lot of wickets, especially with a bit of a weaker uh, Brisbane and Th- Thunder side. I think he's going to be one that's uh, a very good option to have. I know a lot of people are probably looking at the likes of uh, Maxwell or Stoinis, but I'm just looking for someone who's definitely going to have a bit more of a consistent factor, and that's why I'm locking him in. What about you boys? Who are you likely to put the captain on for round one? I'm going to put it on your favourite person in the world, Azza, and Glenn Maxwell. That's more than a fair um, person to have as captain. Absolutely dominated um, the games recently and looks to be a fantastic player to have as captain. I've been a bit of a neggy nelly on him, but no, look, I have definitely turned, turned a corner and he is in my side. Don't have... The cojones to put the captaincy on him, but no, uh, I would not blame him if you did. Ben, what about you? Who are you looking to captain round one? Yeah, I'm, I'm not um, too dissimilar to Damo. I'm going Maxi, and, and I reckon the captaincy is a really important discussion. It's probably the most important decision you'll make in round one. I know a lot of people talk about um, the players on the fringe, and, and the percentage of points they add generally to your side is, is pretty low, but the captain, if you know your captain, you get a massive... Um, a double up and, and that percentage of your score is, is massive. So I think it's a really important discussion for people to consider. And the fact that Stoinis now won't bowl has made this whole conversation a lot more interesting because I think everyone was just, just going to jump on Stoinis uh, and now it's opened mm-hmm. it up. So people are, uh, you know, people might get a head start if you nail this because um, there's a couple of genuine options. So you've got Maxi, who we just talked about. Zampa is a good option. Some people are even talking about Cool to Nile. Probably wouldn't do that, but he is an option on the double game round. And then to throw in a spanner, if Darcy Short gets, you know, low hundreds in the first game and you've loopholed him, it's a bit of a dilemma. So I think that, um, that little dynamic is something people need to spend a fair bit of time thinking about. Um, and I love the fact that Stoinis' um, little niggle has created uh, a few different schools of thought. And I assume we're all putting the vice captaincy on Darcy Short. Like what would he have to score for you to actually take that loophole? That's a very good question, especially with Stars um, having two games. I probably would like to see him get at least probably close to 100 or more, um, especially because given the likes of Maxwell and Zampa, we saw them averaging around the, the 50, 60, 80 scores in the uh, 
T20 side. Um, so that would be um, at least a 160 if they do do well in those two games. So Short's going to have to do fairly well, um, given the Stars have got a double game. I would be hesitant not to take him if he scored uh, anything over 100. And just so that people who are playing the game for the first time this year, how how do you execute a loophole successfully? Azza? Yeah, so uh, loopholes are a very, a very interesting thing. I mean, this year um, the rules have changed uh, significantly to allow us to have dedicated emergencies per each line. Previously, we didn't have that option and it would just be um, a zero on your field and you just get the lowest uh, scoring player from your bench. Now we get a chance to select these emergencies, which gives us, yes, this loophole option. So essentially what that is, is if you have a player like Dan Christian on your bench, who's got the emergency, he Mm -hmm. plays in the first game. Now, if he scores exceptionally well, what you want to do is make sure you then have a non-playing player on your field and then in that position in that position and then you can take Christian's score if Christian doesn't do well then what you want to make sure is you have somebody else ready to come in off your bench so for me the way that I've structured my batting lineup in my side I've got Darcy Short, Marcus Doinis, Glenn Maxwell, Will Jacks and then to finish off I've got James Baisley who probably might play and um might, I might replace him for somebody else. But then I've got Hilton Cartwright and Dan Christian on my bench. So I'm going to be looking to see how Christian goes in that first game. And if he if he does successfully well, then Hilton Cartwright will uh, be given a miss in favour of that non-playing player which comes in. Otherwise, because I'll have the chance straight after the Hobart Hurricanes and Sydney Sixers game to put Cartwright on the field for that non-playing player, it just means I'm just getting a second bite at that chance. I think we move into the Q&A now. So for the people listening to the recording, we are live on Twitch. We have been recording this live for the people who wouldn't be able to listen to the recording before the first bat flip. So we'll wait for some questions to come through. Um, I feel like my biggest issue has been filling that fifth on-field batting position. I would usually just put any random person there, but I've decided to loophole Dan Christian and I've got Ashton Turner and Max Bryant. Um, I'll just turn Ashton Turner into a non-playing player if Christian scores all right. And then it's up to, and then if he doesn't, I've got to decide between Turner or Bryant. <laughs> Probably Bryant wins that one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like, I, I do like Max Bryant. He's in some phenomenal form, especially in the, uh, the Queensland Premier League he scored two centuries back to back on the same day. Uh, I think he's very well priced at sixty seven thousand. He's locked into that opening position at the Brisbane Heat, so he'll definitely be a good choice, especially with Wildermuth out. There's probably a bit of a lack of um, good priced rookies that'll increase in price. So no, I think Max Bryant's definitely one that you can place on your field with some confidence. So here's a question for you, Azza, because yeah. you've been keeping track of it. Any thoughts if the supercoach scoring change is going to have a bigger impact on batters, bowlers, or wicket keepers? It's an interesting one for sure. I, I know I did some um, calculations earlier in the year, and I found that um, batsmen probably won't be doing as well as previous seasons, p- purely because... Um, the way they have changed the strike rate bonus, they won't be getting a huge bonus if they score, you know, incredibly well. Like we saw Darcy Short, you know, have a huge score over a hundred. This year, that score would be reduced quite significantly. So we might see those scores drop. And similarly, as uh, Ben mentioned before, the bowlers uh, have unfortunately lost a a little ground with um, the five runs being taken from the wicket, and also then the run rate. Um, has then dropped. So instead of last year where um, bowlers would get a bonus after two overs, they only now get it over three overs. So those all-rounders that may not be getting those uh, chances and only getting a couple overs is, again, will miss out on that valuable bonus. So I would say that it's it's happened evenly, uh, but the wicket keepers is probably the ones that haven't done too badly because I'll still get all the fielding opportunities that we've seen um, 
But again, they will miss a little bit on that batting side. And Ben, you just went through your list of cheapies that you'd be looking at, but mm. who are your must-have rookies? Who are the must-haves? <laughs> That's a tough question to answer. It depends who's playing, really. Um, so clearly, Basley's the one who looks like he's going to play, as well as Bartlett. Basley's an all-rounder is probably most most attractive as a rookie. Um, another rookie who probably is going to play is Jack Edwards at the Sixers. Um, in some pretty good nick in New South Wales grade cricket, but his T20 form actually wasn't that good. So uh, I might steer clear of him, but he's probably also going to bat around the Jordan Silk five, six marks. Not a great role. Um, so it, it probably will be the guys who are playing like a flag dealer, your Basley, Bartlett, maybe a Hardy. Um, I'm going to throw a little smoky at you as well. Not a rookie, but a player who is in some reasonable form, um, uh, in the trial matches, and that's someone who you'd never talk about on these pods probably, but the Sydney Thunder bowler Nathan McAndrew, who's actually been who's actually been going pretty well at club level with the bat, and I reckon with, with Chris Morris gone, yeah, they've picked up Ben Cutting, but he might actually get elevated a little bit to play almost an all-rounder role, um, and took a couple of wickets the other day in the trial match, and I think he was up in the top three uh, non-wicket-keeping fielders for fielding points last season as well. So a player who just scores in a few different ways, and if he actually gets a game, he's someone who might be worth just putting on the radar at 82K. Um, I like I like the look of him, but I probably need to see that in the Big Bash before I jump on it. We've got a question about Peter Hanscom. Obviously, McDermott's been called up to the Australian squad. Is Peter Hanscom a good replacement for McDermott? I think he's a definite uh, option for sure. Um, the only question is, is it going to be about his role in the Hurricane side and where he sort of fits in? We know mm. that Ben McDermott was likely to be up the order. Uh, I can probably see Hanscom uh, taking sort of that batting around the three to five role, which probably puts a little bit of doubt on how his scoring potential, but it is hard to pass him up, especially at that low price. Um, anyone who picks him, I you know, wish them all the luck, and I hope they do well for him. But no, he's not one that I have got in my side at this stage. He is pretty cheap. He's only you know ninety seven k off the top of my head. I yep. could be wrong on that. So he is very cheap, and he obviously he's got that double game. So he's pretty tempting, and I, I've thought a bit about this. Um, and he's going to take the gloves with with McDermott out. Um, so there's probably some extra points there. I'm, I'm inclined to think he'll bat four, um, which probably isn't the ideal role. So I'm leaning towards not getting him, but it's it's a pretty tough call to make. The only reason why I probably wouldn't get him is the fact that Fletcher has a double game round straight up. Um, otherwise, I'd probably get him. People will be trading stars out to get strikers for game week two for their double one game week. So we've got a question. Is it smarter to trade the cheapies or the gun stars for players after the double game week? Um, says he could potentially hold a 100K salary to and just trade cheapies. Or um, that to me, to me, this strategy doesn't sort of add up in my head. Um, I've, I can't seem to get a team... Mind, mind you, I've been screaming at my team for the last two, two days. I can't get my team to a point where I can have 100K left over and be happy with it. So I think you've got to trade some of the expensive guys for some of the expensive strikers, like a Rashid Khan, a Matt Renshaw, uh, Danny Briggs, if you want him, just those sorts of players. So I think you got to prepare to trade some of these gun stars players to bring in gun strikers players to get yourself ahead early on in the competition because you want to maximize the amount of players who are going to be playing in those two games or two two or three games within the first two weeks of um, the season. I agree with that 100%. I think that's definitely the right way to go about it. The, the, probably the question is who are the – who are the three strikers you actually want for round two? So Rashid's the obvious one. And then the next two are a bit tricky. Um, probably Peter Siddle, maybe, um, was it Phil Salt? Phil Salt? Yep. Um, but without Nessa and Head, they 
there's no, I don't think anyone jumps out as an obvious second best behind Khan. Um, so then, you know, you, you're kind of weighing up uh, Hurricanes players as well, given that they've um, got a double game round in, in round two. So I think you just need to think about who you want to move to. You need to map that out before you, you pick your original team. I know a lot of people are going Zampa straight to Rashid um, around the same kind of price mark. And I think just mapping that out will give you the best chance to um, get as many players on the double as possible. And, and that'll probably be you need to ch- uh, trade your expensive players. Does home field advantage have much impact on the players or the player or the team makeup? Or is there the same impact on all the teams because of the hubs? Yeah, the hubs is definitely going to be an interesting one. And I think obviously early on we're going to see um, the Hurricanes be quite favoured because they're going to be at home um, so often. Looking at some of the stats from last year, which I've um, just pulled up in front of me, looking at home versus away averages, it, is a, it can uh, paint quite an interesting picture. Um, looking at the likes of Darcy Short is a great example. So at a home game for him, he scored, He averaged 78.67 away, 109.3, which is really interesting. Um, but I still think there's no way you, you couldn't uh, look at picking him. But then... Uh, on the on the flip side, where you've got someone like Muhammad Nabi playing with the Renegades, he averaged 126 at home, but 48 away. So I think there is some definite uh, home ground advantage for some players, but I mm. really don't think about that and uh, too much. You want to be picking the best players that are in the best form, um, and you can give some consideration, but it's not one that I've ever given consideration in the past. I will say, if I can jump in on that, so mm. there's two sides who played the home grounds really well, and that was it's always been the Renegades at, at Marvel, which is obviously under the roof, so a unique situation. Um, and they've only got three games at Marvel this season. And then also the Thunder at the showgrounds, which has got that slow kind of uh, spitting pitch, which has suited your slower bowlers. And they've only got four games there as well. So that may impact the way they select their 11 this season as opposed to previous years. So the Thunder may only use two spinners or maybe even one spinner this season. So that means, you know, they've got Chris Green, they've got Jono Cook, they've got Arjun Nair. So one of them might miss out or two of them might miss out. And likewise, the Renegades, obviously, um, they've got a bunch of spinners. So the makeup of that 11 might be impacted a little bit by venue. We've got a question from Bob the Pat Rat. Love the name. He wants to know... Who is the best player around the 125k price range? He can't choose between Ingram, Lawrence, Ty, Lynn, or Kawaja, but he's put etc. So any options? Who's the best option? Oh. Out out of those five, I I'm I'm on the bandwagon. I'm got Andrew Ty in my side. I think he is incredibly underpriced. He's um, back bowling really well. He was obviously off from injury last season, but we know his form's in, um, incredible when he's at his best. Just uh, only two seasons ago, he was priced at 246000 at the start of um, Supercoach BBL 08, and uh, I hope that he can get back to that because that'll just be absolutely fantastic for, for your sides and not something that I definitely want to, to miss out on. So for me, Ty is a fantastic pick. And look, you could not go wrong with uh, any of them, really. I mean, Ingram's obviously got the double game week in round two. Um, Lawrence might play a bit of a different role. The Heat will be interesting to see. Um, we know he's a fantastic player. Chris Lynn, uh, well, he's the top scoring uh, run scorer of the BBL and has been in a, some fantastic form of late. And I find I find it tricky to pick him because I know he, uh, he can be a bit of a trap. Uh, and then lastly, Kawaja. Well, again, he is quite um, underpriced as well, only at about 170000 from memory. And if he can get back into some of the um, form that he has in the past, he's another absolutely fantastic pick. But out of those five, I would be picking Ty. What about you, Ben? Yeah, I tend to agree on that. Um AJ Ty, just he's just so much more consistent than the other ones. Mm. So you've just got to expect a bit of volatility with the with the guys who bat um, and don't really bowl. So you know, Lynn and Kawaja obviously don't bowl. They're just going to be volatile. And um, if you're in a league and you're trying to win each round, that might cost you. 
Um, if you're just trying to climb the rankings, it might be worth taking that punt. Um, and AJ, yeah, AJ Ty just, he'll get you, generally gets a couple of wickets each game and has a pretty good economy rate. If you bowl at the death, like that's the, the ideal role for a bowler because you get those cheap wickets. So, yeah, I think he he's pretty good value at 130. So he's probably going to be the one you go for. Who are our wicket keepers? An, e- an easy question. Uh, at the moment, I've got Andre Fletcher on the field and Lockie Pfeiffer on the bench. Uh, Andre Fletcher obviously has the double game week. Um, I would have loved to have been able to afford Josh Filippo. I think he's going to be a fantastic pick in any sides, especially with the uh, the Sixers not having a bye all year, instead of, uh, unlike the Stars, who do have one in round three. Um, you can also look to have the likes of um, Josh English early on, but uh, there is a bit of concern once the uh, Englishmen come over, as well as looking at maybe a bit of a pod in uh, Sam Harper from the Renegades too, who's uh, quite cheaply priced um, at about one fifth, one nineteen. Um, but at the moment, no, I've got Fletcher and Pfeiffer. What about you, Ben? I'm loving everything about the Spice Man at the moment, so I have to I have to say Fletcher. I love those videos. Um, uh, but yeah, the double game round is just so seductive. Um, even if his form uh, hasn't been overwhelmingly amazing, if you double his his form line, it's still better than what you're going to get out of uh, you know your Hanscom or your um, or Harper. Philippi is a good one you bring up though, because I think we've it's there's a temptation to forget about all the players from the sides who don't have the double game round early, mm. and he's one of those quality players who who you could yeah like you said almost set and forget in a way, um, and he's only one fifty k, so he's a reasonable option to bring up, and and like you said Inglis as well, um, but just that double game round it's just so seductive, and and if he plays well you could probably play Fletcher round two and then move him to Carey for their double game round, round three, once Carey's back. So um, that's why I've gone for that. But I, I'm not opposed to going Philippi or, or even Inglis. I think they're solid options. I'm, I've got the same setup as Azza. So Andre Fletcher with Lucky Fiverr on the bench. Um, just simple, works. Uh, got a query on Darcy Short. Um, with the Hurricanes... Meredith, Ellis, Boland, and Faulkner should bowl four overs. And then that only leaves four overs for uh, Botha, David, Short, and Jax. Mm. So, does, will, so will Short bowl? Will Jax bowl? Does David or Botha even play? <laughs> um. Does Short and Jacks only do two overs each, but then that means their bowling score won't count very well. It will count, but it won't be very. It won't add much to their total, their batting total. Does that? Is that a bit of a worry? Well, the way the Hurricanes line up is at the moment. I mean, you've, yeah, uh, West has mentioned Meredith, Ellis, Boland, and Faulkner. Well, obviously, they're missing a spinner. Um, obviously, the Johan Botha has been signed up to take up that mantle early on. It will be very interesting to see who bowls. I think um, given uh, both has obviously come out of retirement and you know, um, 38 now, I think you probably may only uh, bowl a couple overs, but then which then means we we'll, might see the likes of um, Short or Jax get in and over as well. I do hope um, we see them bowling a little bit more than that, and, and we, we may, especially depending on how the pitch plays in, in that first mm first game. If it does happen to be a bit more of a spinning wicket, then um, we could see, see both uh, Short and Jacks bowling a little bit more. And it's also probably worth mentioning too about this new um, uh, sub rule that's in place too. Especially, We might actually see that in play if that uh, pitch does turn into a bit of a more of a spinning wicket. They may end up uh, subbing out one of the pace bowlers um, and trying to bring in somebody else and then have the likes of Short Jacks and both are bowling a bit more. Bit, bit of a wait and see prospect. Um, we should know more after the first game tonight. No more questions, guys. So I think we can wrap up the recording portion of the podcast. So 
Thank you, Ben, for coming onto the podcast. And everyone, you can pick up the Honeyball BBL magazine uh, from the Honeyball website for just five ninety five. Grab it before um, lockout as well, because there's lots of uh, easy advice which will help you make some decisions. So uh, yeah, please jump on. It's been it's been selling like hotcakes actually, so it's been awesome. Um, so I'm definitely planning something similar for the AFL season for those who who are interested. Um, but yeah, thanks heaps for having me. It's been fun. And as a thank you for joining me again. Absolute pleasure as always. Um, and yeah, I'll just also give a plug out to our uh, own page, Jock Reynolds. Be sure to keep an eye out. Um, there's going to be some late content dropping very soon um, to help you um, plan for that lockout. Going to be looking at uh, the fixture planner, some overseas player abilities, an injured list, and then something that we've had at the Jock Reynolds uh, site before for the AFL season. The cheat sheet is back. So be sure to mm-hmm. keep an eye out on the site. It should be hopefully be out later, um, but before lockout for sure.